Good evening. I'm Joe Carol Lauder, and I'm chairman of FAPE, and we are so pleased that you're all here to um, enjoy this evening with us at this wonderful landmark building. We have come together tonight to recognize David Rubenstein, a dedicated philanthropist and advocate of U.S. political and cultural history. This year, FAPE will present David with the 2013 Leonore and Walter Annenberg Award for Diplomacy Through the Arts. The award was established in 2008 to recognize Americans who have demonstrated by a commitment to the arts, the exchange of creativity and ideas that represent the rich and diverse culture of the United States. David is co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group. As chairman of the Kennedy Center, David recently made the single largest gift to the institution, which will help fund a Stephen Hall designed expansion for educational classrooms, rehearsal studios, and programming. Thank you for this enormous gift to our country. We're really lucky. <laughs> David collects historical artifacts, including original copies of the Emancipation Proclamation, the Declaration of Independence, and the Magna Carta, all of which he has donated or pledged to American institutions for public exhibition. I think that's quite extraordinary. I would also like to recognize David's wife, Alice, who may or may not be here, but we, she has been a wonderful friend to FAPE, and we thank her for that. We are delighted that author and historian John Meacham will join David in a conversation about the inspiration behind his philanthropy and collecting. John is executive editor at Random House, a regular on MSNBC's Morning Joe, which I love, former co-anchor of the public affairs broadcast Need to Know on PBS, editor-in-chief of Newsweek, and contributing editor of Time Magazine. John's latest book, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, was published by Random House in 2012 and is a number one New York Times bestseller. In April 2009, John received the Pulitzer Prize for his fourth book, American Lion, Andrew Jackson in the White House. It's a great honor to have both of you here, and we thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So I guess the first question is, baseball cards weren't enough? <laughs> I mean, what, well, um, they're about as expensive now. When I went to college, my mother, uh, thinking that baseball cards were not valuable, threw away all the baseball cards I had gathered over six, 16 years. So that's and Rosebud. And they would yeah. be more valuable than the Magna Carta if she had that's just right. kept them. So that's right. unfortunately, they've been disposed. So we found the Rosebud early on in this conversation. Absolutely. That's terrific. There is a theme linking what you have acquired and loaned, and that's the story of American freedom. Why do you think it is that against all historical odds, and much of the history, not only of the West, but of the East, American freedom has in fact unfolded in a progressive way? Well, clearly, uh, the founding fathers had a vision for the country that in many ways um, we now are the beneficiaries of. Now, of course, they were a small elite of white men who were privileged, educated, and so forth. And when Thomas Jefferson wrote the sentence that became the most famous sentence in the English language, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed with, by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He was not talking about people who were Jewish. He was not talking about people who were black. He was not talking about uh, people who were uneducated. However, that sentence later was transformed to be the meaning of what the country's all about. And Lincoln later took that, and, and in his Gettysburg Address, he basically took Jefferson's line and said, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this country a new nation dedicated um, to all men are created equal. And um, I'd say that uh, progressively, we've gotten more freedoms that have lived up to what the founding fathers maybe had in mind. In other words, they didn't have in mind the kind of democracy that we have today where 
everybody gets to participate, people actually get to vote. There, as you may know, the Electoral College was set up to keep people from actually voting for president directly. We still have that more or less. It but, worked. It worked. That and, was and senators weren't elected directly right. uh, either. They were elected by the state legislatures. But because of the Jefferson's words, and because I think other people who built on those words, like Lincoln, we now have a democracy where um, our greatest single attribute that people admire around the rest of the world is our freedom. The people have the freedom in this country to do things that they couldn't otherwise do um, without the kind of Constitution and, and Bill of Rights we have. And also, I, I take it in my own case, I come from very modest circumstances. Um, my father uh, didn't go to college, didn't graduate from high school, neither did my mother. Um, my father never made more than $7,000 a year. I grew up in a, in a very Jewish ghetto in Baltimore. And the idea that I could um, rise up to make the kind of money that I've been fortunate to make and, and have the kind of position I now have um, probably couldn't have happened in many other countries. So in my case, I feel that the freedom that I have, not as an only American, but somebody who's Jewish, is not a freedom that I could have had elsewhere. I doubt that somebody with my background could have done what I've been able to do um, in other countries, and therefore I'm very proud of what our country is, and I, what I do with these documents is try to buy them and put them on display, not so I can say, see what I own, but it is, think what you Americans have as your freedoms, and think about your freedoms and how lucky we all are. Um, you know, it's very sad that Americans do not know as much about their history as I think they should. Um, in a recent survey by Pew, um, when, when asked, uh, by Americans were asked, who was the first Secretary of Treasury? 30% said Larry Summers, which is not the case. 35% um, of Americans said, uh, what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War? They said the Rhine River. So, and sadly, another survey came out recently that said that more high school students can name the first three names of the Three Stooges than the first three names of any founding fathers. So my theory has been that we need to get people to know more about their history and therefore also more about the freedoms that we have which make our country so distinctive and which enable somebody like me to come from modest circumstances and get to where I have been. So that's why I try to buy these things, put them on display, and have people um, think about them, and then ultimately they will, of course, go to these institutions. Are you sure that the only respondent in that wasn't Larry Summers? <laughs> but we'll move on. Uh, the well, he would say the best, let's say. Oh, they are, they are, they are. The limited poll. The other Carlisle, Thomas, wrote about the tension between is history made by individuals or impersonal forces? Is geography destiny or is the character of a leader and a people? Where do you come down on that? Well, I don't think you can say it's either or. For example, you have studied Thomas Jefferson, and uh, I did read your book, and it was magnificent, and I would be very surprised if it doesn't win another Pulitzer Prize, because I think it was a great book. And you managed to do that, and Je people have devoted their whole life to Jefferson, haven't gotten all the facts right and everything that you did in your one book, and you spent, I think you told me, about four years on it. So it's incredible, uh, and I hope you do win the Pulitzer Prize. Unfortunately, I'm not on the committee, but um, <laughs> I, I will, I'll send, in, I'll send in my support. Thank um, you. Look, if you didn't have men like George Washington, or Andrew Jackson, or Thomas Jefferson, or Benjamin Franklin, uh, I don't think the country would be quite where we are today. So I don't think you can say it's just certain forces, and nor can I, do I think you can say it's only certain people. It's a combination of things, and that's why no one has really come up with a perfect answer as to whether it's humans that really drive for history, or it's certain causes that are beyond what any human can do. So, for example, um, I think if Franklin Roosevelt had not been president of the United States during World War II, uh, the situation could have been much different. If Abraham Lincoln had not been president during the Civil War, I think the country would have broken up because he was so determined to hold the country together above anything else. He wasn't determined to free the slaves, he was determined to hold the Union together. Had somebody lesser than, than, Tom, than Abraham Lincoln been there, I think the country would have been different. So you can't really say it's just humans or you can't really say it's certain forces. It's really a combination of things, but there's no doubt that great people can achieve uh, extraordinary things that, that, that economic forces themselves wouldn't have been able to achieve. Yeah. The great counterfactual, which is the fancy way of the what if uh, theory, is what if Winston Churchill had died when the car struck him on Fifth Avenue in 1931? And what would have happened if the assassin who killed the mayor of Chicago, who was sitting next to Franklin Roosevelt in Miami in December of 1932, if Roosevelt had died and if Churchill had died, what would have happened at the end of the 30s and or, end of the 40s? Or, or suppose the, uh, 
the bomb that was going off to, to kill Hitler had actually gone off and, and killed him, as came close to doing. So many of these things, and, and you, just, you just can't say, and that's the joy of history, is, is <laughs> going back and kind of figuring out how things happened and how would the world have been different. We're never going to resolve those things, but I do think that history is uh, enjoyable to me because you get to read about people and see what they did and how they confronted problems, and you often say to yourself, how would I have dealt with that? or how could this person have done something differently? You know, we'll spend a lot of time always wondering whether if a certain president had done something differently, would the world be a better place? And really, that's a, a thing that we all, I think, have to think about ourselves. Maybe everybody isn't among us going to be somebody who's going to be president of the United States or be a great world leader, but all of us have a chance, an opportunity, to change the world in a little bit of, 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 of a respect. This is what I mean. Um, if you're president of the United States, yes, you're going to make decisions that are going to affect everybody. And if you make the right decisions, it's going to be good for everybody, hopefully. But everybody in this room and everybody in this city and everybody in this country and everybody in this world can make some difference. You can do some things that make your community, your family, uh, the city that you live in, the community better. And I, I, I encourage people, increasingly when I talk to students, to try to make the world a slightly better place and don't wait until your deathbed and say, I wish I had done more with my community, my family, I wish I had done something to make the world a better place. Take advantage of your opportunities now and, and don't spend all your time trying to make money. Don't spend all your time trying to get prestige or glory or power. Spend some time trying to make the world a better place, however you might define it better. It's either with people who are underprivileged, people who need better education, people that don't have the freedoms that you have. And, and that's what I try to encourage students to do and, and young people to do when I, try to talk, when I talk to them at, at schools. So I try to say to them, don't just go out and try to make money because you'll never be happy just making money. Uh, there's no evidence that having money makes you happy. Uh, most of the people I know who are extremely wealthy are not extremely happy. Uh, the, some of the happiest, I, I know people who aren't extremely wealthy don't believe that, but, but <laughs> the people that I as, know who are the, the happiest. As, as the poorest person on right, the stage, right. I'd be willing to roll the dice. Right. Actually, uh, a little Zoloft and a couple of billion, that would be fine. Most of the people in the Forbes 400, I think, are tortured. They just aren't yeah, happy. Yeah, that's right. Really, you know, most of the happiest people I've ever met are people who are not wealthy. They're just true, obviously. Yeah. You know, look at some of the people who have staggering sums of money. They're extremely un unhappy people. And, and I, I, in my case, I am, I'm very fortunate. I feel I'm very happy. Happiness is the most elusive thing in life. Personal happiness is by far the most elusive thing. And all of you who have struggled with trying to how to be happy know how difficult it is. What makes you happy? Your personal satisfaction, your children's satisfaction, um, what you've achieved. It's very difficult to get personal happiness. And very few people who are wealthy because of their, their wealth are happy in my view. I think people like you who may not be as wealthy as you think you want to be, you're probably a very happy person. You're, you've done a great number of things. And when your time has gone and you meet your maker, um, it isn't going to make a difference whether you had more money when you die or not. You're not going to be happier because you had more money at the time that you die. You just aren't. I'm a southerner and a Christian, so I believe in tragedy. Okay. Um, okay. We may just have to agree to well, disagree on the uh, pursuit well, of happiness. Well, I, uh, I worked for such a man. I worked for Jimmy Carter. He was a southerner and a Christian. And, and he uh, ain't happy. He wasn't happy. That's a technical term we use in the South. Uh, but when you talk to students, when you talk yes. to younger folks, you've talked about your own rise, the extraordinary opportunities that democratic capitalism has created uh, from generation to generation. What do you think we can do about what I'd argue is the central, one of the central tensions of the era, which is the declining household income, that you, we do have a we are at risk, it seems, with a fa any fair reading of the statistics, right. is that we are, in fact, at risk of, for the first time, passing on to a generation a less well-off country that would therefore perhaps have less opportunity. It's a, it's a strange phenomenon that we have now because historically, Americans have always felt that their children would live a better life than they. Now, for the first time, surveys show that Americans don't think their children are going to have a better life, and they may be right. Um, we have, un unfortunately, we've spent more money than we really made, and as a result, we have $16 trillion of debt, $1.2 or so trillion dollars of annual deficit, $60 trillion of unfunded Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid liabilities, $4 trillion of unfunded state pension liabilities, 
and we are not going to be able to get out of this easily. When the Social Security system was first set up, the first payments were made in 1940, there were 30 workers for every person collecting benefits. Today, that's about three and a half to one, and it will soon be two and a half to one. It's not sustainable. So we have to recognize that we, we need to cut entitlements or benefits or raise taxes or have greater economic growth. There's no other way out of it. And at the moment, we're not going to have the kind of economic growth we want. So we're going to have to probably increase taxes a bit or cut, cut entitlements a bit. And it's, it's, if we don't do that, our children surely will not have the lifestyle that we have ourselves. In our, and everybody in this room has grown up in a time where the United States was the leading economy in the world. We became the, small, the biggest economy in the world in 1870. And we've been the biggest economy and the dominant economy since 1940s, the largest since 1870. In our lifetime, we will not be the biggest economy in the world. China will surpass us. Now, not per capita, but in overall uh, GDP. And probably India will surpass us as well, probably in our lifetime as well. And, and, and we will per capita go down from being the number one per capita income country in the world to probably somewhere in the top 10, but maybe even below that. And so we, we have to make some changes. And unfortunately, we, we haven't been able to confront these issues. Take the recent uh, legislation in Washington. When we had the, the famous uh, fiscal cliff issue, we patted ourselves on the back because we gave 99% of Americans a tax cut, permanent. And 1%, the upper 1% represented by everybody in this room, um, got a tax increase. You can't make the budget work and the economic situation work when 99% of the people get a, a tax cut. Um, it, it's uh, hard to believe, and it's not politically correct to say this, but if you took the wealth away of all the people in the Forbes 400, not their income, you, not, not just their income, took their entire wealth away, it wouldn't solve the problem. There aren't enough of those people. You the only way you're going to solve the problem is by getting taxes up or, 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 or spending down for people who make incomes between 50 and let's say $150,000. When President Obama ran the first time around, he said, I want to protect the middle class. And he, I, nobody above, uh, below $250,000 would get a tax increase. I, I think he may have made a mistake in the sense that the middle class is really $70,000 for a family of four. If you want to protect the middle class, it's really $70,000. When you, when you get to 250, you're only, there's only 2% of the people above 250. So there just isn't enough revenue um, to deal with that. So we have to deal with this problem relatively soon. The income disparity is getting worse, not better. Uh, the upper 1% of the population in this country now has roughly 25% of the income. The upper 1% has 40% of the assets in the country, and that's not sustainable. So we've got to do more for the uh, lower income classes. And the only way to deal with that, the only way, there's no other way, is better education. The only way out of this is to better educate our people. 25% 25%, 25% of the people who enter high school in this country do not graduate. In some urban areas, that percentage is as high as 40%. They enter high school, they don't graduate. But those who graduate are not actually in such great shape either. Uh, last night, I heard from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at a dinner where he said one out of four people who are theoretically eligible for military service can't get in any longer because they just can't pass the test. They don't really have the the um, academic ability, even if they graduate from high school, they can't pass the test. One out of four, um, or only one out of four is eligible. Three out of four can't get in. So uh, we aren't, even those people that graduate aren't really um, in, in shape to really do necessary things. And one final thing, since we're sitting in a library, uh, one of the biggest problems we have is not just that we aren't educating our young people, and it is a tragedy that we have the finest higher education system in the world. We're the envy of the world. Everybody wants to get their children to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, or the equivalent. Uh, all over the world, but we, we have a d disgraceful public education system in many parts of the country. But leave the system aside for a moment. Since we're in a library, 12% of all Americans are completely and totally illiterate. Not that they can read a little bit, they can't read at all. 20% are functionally illiterate, which means that they can read enough to maybe read a stop sign or a couple other things, but they can't do their job adequately because they really can't read. And more amazingly, 30% of all the people who graduate from college in this country never read another book. Never read another book. And 40% of the American families have not bought a book in the last five years. Not bought a book or visited a bookstore or bought a book online. 40% of all American families. So we aren't educating our people. We're not in, in sending them to read. It, it's, it's a situation which is it's just very unfortunate. And we're going to have to make a lot of changes if we're going to get to the situation where more people can do what I did, which is to kind of rise up from a situation where they found themselves in very modest circumstances at, at birth. 
Is there an analogous moment to the array of issues you've described where we rose to the challenge with essentially this legislative system, this uh, a populace that is in fact bought into uh, oh. inextricably linked to the benefit structure. Is oh. there some is there, is there some way of drawing on the past to see what we should do moving forward? Well, one of the problems we have today is that in Washington, where I live, the Democrats and Republicans don't really talk to each other. Um, it used to be the case that you were a great legislator if you knew how to get a compromise done. Right. Now you're a great legislator if you stand on principle and don't compromise. So the people that rise up are the people that don't compromise. Until that system becomes more functional, we're not really going to solve this problem. And we're going to have a series of every couple months, we're going to you know, figure out whether the budget is, is, is going to be, or the spending is going to be continued through a continuing resolution or not. It's, you can't run a company, you can't run an organization where every couple months you're trying to figure out whether, what the, the, the revenues are going to be and, and, and what your responsibilities are. It's not a, not a very good situation. One of the other problems we're also facing is this. We were the dominant economy for a long time. And in fact, in 1960, this country was 46% of the world's GDP. Almost half the GDP of the world was in one country, the United States. Today we're 20 percent and heading down. And that's because after the Cold War ended, uh, the countries that, that were freed and finally could pursue a capitalist system, they did so. And as a result, they are playing our game that they, we played so well for a long time. They, are, they have entrepreneurs, they incent entrepreneurs, they're growing their economies, they're not borrowing too much money, they're not promising too much in benefits. And the result is that the emerging markets have emerged. In the next year, 2014, the, 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 the total GDP of the emerging markets will surpass that of the developed markets, which I now call the submerging markets, because at the rate we're going, we can't compete with China, India, Brazil, and other countries unless we make dramatic changes. They have much younger populations than we do. They have uh, fewer in, in, uh, debt than we do, and they have uh, fewer entitlement uh, re responsibilities than we do. So we've got to make changes. We have to recognize that we're not operating in the world that we used to be and that we all grew up in. We're operating in a world where the emerging markets are emerging, and they have emerged, and now they're going to surpass us unless we make dramatic changes. You worked in the White House as a young man 30 or so years ago. What has changed culturally to prevent the kinds of conversations and compromise that were more familiar then than they are now? Well, you're very kind to mention that I worked in the White House but not point out that I got inflation to 19 percent, which is very hard to do. I just, <laughs> since you mentioned no one buys books, I'm right, trying right. to, you know, I've got. So, uh, I was trying to be nice because I was so depressed by that statistic. Um, you know, it is, I never thought when I left, um, you know, when I joined the White House, I was 27 years old. I, I like to say that I wasn't qualified for my job. I was three years out of law school, but uh, many people in that administration weren't qualified, I thought, so I wasn't the only one. Um, <laughs> but to be serious, I um, never thought that the Carter years would be looked at as the good old days. But now we have a situation where the, in those days the Democrats and Republicans talked to each other. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans were willing to work out deals with each other. And in the last year of Carter's administration, we sent a budget up to Capitol Hill which had a proposed budget deficit of $39 billion. It was laughed out of the Congress. They said, this is too high. We'll never have a $39 billion deficit. Call that budget back, and we had to set up a, a balanced budget, or at least proposed balanced budget. Now we'd love to have $39 billion uh, deficits. Um, I, I think that the principal changes are these. One, the world is different because we uh, now capitalism has really spread throughout the world, and we have much, more, great, much greater competitors. Secondly, uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans really don't talk to each other. Third, the media has changed. It's now pervasive. In those days, we watched 15 minutes of evening news, and that's all people focused on. We all work worked all day to get on the 15 minutes of evening news and maybe the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post. Now everybody's got a blogosphere, everybody's got a blog, everybody's got a, um, an internet uh, uh, you know, uh, thing that they, they uh, write for or read. Everybody is 24 hours a day focusing on the news and uh, everybody's afraid of being criticized and as a result, members of Congress are frozen, the administration is frozen and nothing seems to get done because everybody's afraid that somebody will criticize them. It's different than it was in the well, good old days of the Carter years. <laughs> so what do we do about it? Well, I wish, you know, if I had the solution, I honestly would not be here. I would be down in Washington, you know. Presiding. Um, or, I'd be on, I, or I'd be on Good Morning Joe where, where the real solutions uh, uh, to the world are, are, are come up right. with. Um, um, 
I, 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 I don't have an answer, obviously. There's no easy answer. If there was an easy answer, we'd come up with it. It's, it, it what we have to convince people is of one thing that I, I, would, I like the president a great deal. I think he's done, he's done incredible things to transform the image of the country around the world, and his election is really um, the embodiment of what Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln were really talking about. The idea that an African American be elected president of the United States twice is really stunning when you think about it. From the time when you and I were growing up, we would never have dreamed that was, that was thought that was possible. But I wish the president would do one thing and use one word more, and that word is sacrifice. We have to ask the American people to sacrifice. Um, you know, very few, and the president's not the only one, very few politicians will say today, I need you to sacrifice because we can't afford everything. We have to, everybody has to feel some pain. So everybody's going to get a tax increase, not a tax uh, decrease. Everybody has to pay something. But we seem unwilling to tell people, all the politicians, not just President Obama, all politicians are unwilling to use that word sacrifice. Unless we go through a number of years of sacrificing, we're not going to ever get to the point where we can pay off the debt we have and make sure our children can live in, the, in, a, in a better lifestyle than we have. Do you think it's going to require a crisis on the level of perhaps September 11th or the crash of 08, 09? We are to create a climate for that kind of. Um, unfortunately, I do. Um, the way the Congress works and the President works, chronic problems are kicked down the road a bit. Um, we just kick them down the road, and we don't really solve them. We we just we, we know we have them, and we say we'll deal with them later. For example, right now we have all this debt. Now, why is it that we have so much debt, and you know everybody seems to be living okay? Well, it's because interest rates are being kept artificially low, and the Chinese have nothing better to do with their money. If the Chinese announce tomorrow they're not buying any more of our debt, and the Japanese weren't going to buy any more of our debt, and the Saudis weren't going to buy more of our debt, with the interest rates would, would go up, and we couldn't afford it. We're paying about 250 to 300 billion dollars a year in interest. If we had to pay normalized interest rates, probably we'd be paying 750 to a trillion dollars a year in interest. We couldn't afford that. So we've been able to kick it down the road for a while because we're the only country that has the reserve currency. People have to use the dollar, and because people think our credit is still good despite our credit rating, and because we're still the biggest economy in the world, and maybe because we have the big, biggest military force in the world, people are still willing to let us get away with some things other countries couldn't get away with. But I honestly think we're not going to um, solve these problems until we have a crisis. If the stock market went down 1,000 points tomorrow, and 1,000 points the next day, and 1,000 points the third day, then people in Washington say we've got to do something different. Last time when we had a special committee that met, there was a special committee of Congress to deal with the, uh, the debt limit about a year ago. And uh, as a result of the super machinations committee. back and forth, the super committee. super committee, the super committee was created. The super committee was supposed to resolve all these problems and it came up with no solutions. And the result of all that was our credit rating went from the first time ever below AAA. And what happened to interest rates? They went down. So members of Congress said, well, wait a second, if the credit rating goes down and interest rates go down, what's the big deal? So people didn't take it as seriously as I think they should have that we couldn't come up with a solution. So I think what we have to do is have something really bad happen, like the stock market goes down dramatically, the dollar goes down dramatically, before people really take it seriously. When we had the TARP problem, actually the first time Congress didn't pass the TARP legislation, they eventually did because they were scared to death. But you need something like that to scare people in Washington to get something done, or 9-11. Uh, I, we, nobody wants another 9-11 and nobody wants any of these kind of things that I'm talking about. But I'm afraid that we're, we're in a sclerotic situation in Washington. And unless somebody is scared to death, nothing is going to change. Now, interest rates being so low and the Chinese still buying our debt, we can play this game for a couple more years. But there's a famous economist named Herb Stein, who is better known today as the father of Ben Stein, the comedian. And he said when he was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, if something can't keep going on forever, eventually it won't. And these low interest rates. <laughs> These low interest rates, they can't keep going on forever. They're too low. And so when the interest rates go to a normalized you know, situation, we're going we're gonna to um, we're gonna have to face the, face, face the price of the music there. I can have to do one of the smallest categories in, in our culture, witty economic remarks. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So in the long run, all this, I just, I don't, I still don't quite see any imminent solution to what is essentially, you use the image of sclerosis, right, right. what Jonathan Rauch has called demosclerosis, right. which is that we all have some part of this, and we see the special virtue and brilliance of that program, of that benefit, right. and can't imagine why everyone else isn't sacrificing. And your question is, so? Is what's the, 
is that presidential leadership? Is that cultural leadership? Well, it, it's not likely that any one person can do enough to get everybody doing what they need to do. I think it, from presidential leadership would be good, congressional leadership would be good, recognition in the country that we have to sacrifice. It will take a while. You have to educate people. Nothing is going to happen overnight. I think over the next two or three years, if we could educate people about the fact that we can't afford our lifestyle any longer and we're going to be sinking and submerging, not emerging, unless we make changes, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's, we're not going to be in a situation that we're, we're happy with. Our children won't grow up in an economic environment where they um, live the kind of lifestyle that we live. Thinking about education in the, in the sense you raised it a moment ago, as you look around the the country, is there anything in K through 12 education reform that makes you cheerful about our prospects? Well, again, to, to, to reiterate before I answer that question, it is amazing when I go around the world, when people don't ask me for um, economic advice, they don't say, can you give me advice because you in the United States are so smart about how to run your economy? They don't say that. They don't say uh, to me, can you give us cultural advice because your culture is now so wonderful? They say to me, can you tell me how to get my child into Harvard? Um, because that's what people want. They admire these enormously um, um, successful private education institutions and to some extent public education institutions. We are the envy of the world in what we have in the higher education. So it is such a, um, un, an incongruous situation that we have the greatest universities in the world by far. I think something like 15 of the top 20 universities in the world are in the United States. Yet we have a K-12 system that's an embarrassment to our country. The good news about that is that while there have been many problems in the K-12 system, the, the um, people are paying attention to it for the first time in many years. Uh, this city um, uh, has paid a lot of attention and, and, and very good people to work on it. But I think the, uh, the, the charter school um, movement has had a lot of uh, success because it's gotten parents more involved. It's given uh, parents and teachers more responsibility. I think that's been a big plus in many cities. I think movements like KIPP have been very, very good. So people are paying attention to it, but it's such a gigantic problem that I don't think overnight we're going to solve it. And again, even if we could improve our schools K-12 overnight, we're not going to quickly get rid of these illiteracy problems I referred to or the high school dropout rates. Now, in high school dropouts, and I, I think this is a very important point, um, a lot of people have dropped out of high school and done very well in life. But generally, if you drop out of high school, you are six times as likely to be incarcerated as somebody who didn't drop out of high school. And you're likely to make, over the course of your life, about a third of the income of somebody who graduated from high school. So people who grad drop out of high school are more likely to be involved in our criminal justice system, so-called, and, and uh, more likely than not to have a very low income. And we have to do something about that. You cannot get the Forbes 400 people to run the country and tell everybody, this is, the country's okay, we're making a lot of money. You've got to have the, everybody in the bottom doing better and feeling that there's an opportunity to get to the top. And, and unless we have that system, I don't think we're really going to be able to live up to the image that Thomas Jefferson had and, and Abraham Lincoln had for the country. But while I have you here, and I should say, um, when people told me about this event tonight, or people told me about this event, mostly people thought I was going to interview you, and that's why I think they all came. So, um, <laughs> I don't think so. Because what they you want to know say if you is, can get their kid into Harvard. That's right. Um, well, actually, um, I, I did interview Drew Faust at Davos, and there was a Harvard event, and there were about four or 500 people there. And, um, and so my job was to interview her, and, and I, I said to her, look, um, everybody has in mind, their mind one question, which is, uh, how do you get your kid in Harvard? How much does it cost? That's the real question. That's the real question. Uh, of course, she deflected that. But um, um, and let me ask you a question, to be serious. Um, you, you spent four years with Thomas Jefferson I studying did. him. I did. Do you admire him more today than when you started your work, and why? I do admire Jefferson more because I think that unlike any other founder, we put too much on him. James Parton, a 19th century biographer, wrote that if America is right, then Jefferson was right, but if Jefferson was wrong, then America was wrong, which you don't hear about Hamilton, you don't hear about Adams, you don't hear about Washington. And so I, I stepped back from that to try to figure out, well, why does he resonate so much and seem relevant from age to age? And I think it's because he spoke to the best of us and the worst of us. No one articulated better, in the, in a line, you own it, uh, no one articulated better the promise of the United States and what we could, could be. But he also, in his own life, fell short and is a lot like what we are. 
when we're being honest about ourselves. And so uh, my sense is that he, was, for all the Jeffersons, the Jefferson the agrarian, Jefferson the secessionist, Jefferson the FDR uh, idol, for all those Jeffersons, the real one was a human being who had ambitions and appetites and who is buried at Monticello. Well, speaking of one of his appetites, more people have been interested in this other area than anything else about Jefferson lately. And that is, um, do you think it is the case that he fathered six children with Sally Hemings? And was it a surprise to you that people were surprised that that happened? And maybe you could explain that actually Sally Hemings was his wife's stepsister. Half sister. Half sister. Which is even more interesting. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, his, now these are, I am, as I said, I'm a southerner, so this is all kind of familiar to me. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, you might describe his uh, father in law and what this situation was with his father in law and right. how that came about. Right. Uh, I can't tell that joke. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's this close, but not quite. Um, John Wales was a uh, debt collector and lawyer from Lancashire who came to Virginia, he had a daughter, uh, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson, Patty, who married early, uh, lost her husband, and then fell in love with and married Thomas Jefferson in what really was a love match. He also, with uh, an enslaved woman he owned, fathered Sally Hemings. And the Hemings family were in the odd and now unthinkable culture of slavery, a very protected family within this universe of these two families. So the Hemingses were the enslaved people who were kept closest to the, the, their owners. Uh, and my sense is, of course it's true, partly because any man as driven sexually as Thomas Jefferson self-evidently was. One of the first letters we have is of him talking about either having sex with enslaved women, perhaps servant women, or perhaps prostitutes in Williamsburg. It's on about page six of the published Jefferson letters. He pursued uh, the married wife of his best friend in a kind of Smollett Richardson kind of way, uh, leaving notes in her sleeve and, and, and that sort of thing. If you, that's kind of like reading the Star Report in 18th century prose. Um, so he was, and he also, Mrs. Jefferson, one of the reasons she died when she did is that she was serially pregnant. So this was a man of enormous appetite for art, for architecture, for power, for food, for wine. And he believed that sexual activity, he had a very clear medical sense that that was critical to a well-balanced life. Well, he was right. And I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I again, I, I, we're, but, we, we've known each other a long time, but I'm not going you know, to, you know, so when that. his wife died, he was 39, and he said, right. she asked him to never remarry because I don't want my children to have a stepmother, because I had a terrible stepmother, right. so he honored that. Right. So how old was he when he met Sally Hemings, and how old was she? She was either 14 or 15. Uh, she had come, she'd accompanied Jefferson's daughter, the daughter he'd left behind, one of the daughters he'd left behind, one daughter died, and he was minister to France. He wanted, because the daughter, one of the daughters in Virginia had died, he wanted his other daughter with him with, uh, in France, and the family in Virginia sent Sally Hemings with uh, the young girl. Now, 14 sounds appalling to our ears. The age of consent in the state of Virginia was 12. Annette Gordon Reed, a friend of this institution, uh, uncovered that in her scholarship. John Marshall married a 16 year old. James Madison wooed a 15 year old. So we have to put this in some context uh, in terms of what was happening then. Uh, in what I call the Treaty of Paris, uh, in what, and I think that the most one of the sweetest moments in a way, most courageous moments, is if you were a white, if you were living in the 18th century and fate was dealing you cards, 
you wanted the hand Thomas Jefferson was dealt. Eldest son of a landowning, slave-owning family, beautifully educated, expected to rule, born for command, tall, charming, handsome, absolutely very little except disease to come and, and ruin your life. If you're Sally Hemings, you have about the worst hand, right? You're a powerless young woman, you're clearly attractive, you are enslaved, and your owner has initiated or is certainly carrying on uh, some kind of sexual relationship. They're in France, which had freedom laws, which meant that if you were a slave and brought to France, you could go to the city hall and declare your freedom. Her brother was there with her, and so she wasn't totally on her own. She apparently says she might do this. Jefferson wants her to come back with him when he's returning. And in what I think is one of the most courageous moments I know of in the history of American slavery, Sally Hemings negotiates with him and says, if I go back with you, any children we have must be freed by the time they're 21. Now, I have friends who are lawyers who say they could have gotten her a lot better deal. But I think you have to put yourself in, in, in her shoes and recognize that as a woman who was doing the best she could with what she well, had. He honored that commitment, but yes, why he did. did he not free her upon his death? He didn't want it in the paper. He didn't want it in the will. He was so, remember, th th for people who think that this scandals just started, I mean, one of the things I like to say in New York in particular about Hamilton and Jefferson is at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. You know, so <laughs> that's one thing uh, so I think is important. The, uh, he did not, in 1802, his second year as president, a, a huge expose of the Hemings relationship is published in the Richmond paper. So this was very much part of the political, right. there's, a politi there's a political cartoon with the caption, Thomas Jefferson, a philosophic cock. So this was but dark he, ne sound, he never denied it. Sound. He never denied it or admitted it. He just said it was scurrilous to talk about no, it. No, no, he, he apparently denied it directly uh, once. Really? There's a little, there's a okay. little fuzziness there like someone else whose middle name is Jefferson. Um, there's something providential about that. Uh, yes. But it depends on what the meaning of... Um, but I think that he did, he did not want to affirm these rumors by having her in the will. Here's what the family did. When he, uh, he dies on the 4th of July, 1826, Sally Hemings leaves the mountain, leaves Monticello, and goes and lives in Charlottesville as a free white woman. So, and no one bothered her. Uh, eventually, Jefferson's daughter gave her her time, as it was, as it was known. So, um, if I could, I'd like to just tell two stories, one relating to sex, which I, obviously people like, and uh, another relating to uh, the thing we were, we were gonna talk about a little bit, but we have. Um, I got into buying these historic documents by happenstance. And let me just describe this for a moment if I could. Um, many people in life plan to do certain things and then they don't, aren't able to do it. But very few people actually plan their life and have certain happen and you know, it just rarely happens. Many things happen by happenstance. So if you all think about your lives, how many of you today are here today because or you met your spouse or you are in your career because of some uh, thing that was unusual, you didn't expect it to happen. And that's really how I got into this. I didn't sit down and say, I want to buy a lot of historic documents and, and put them on display so Americans can know more about their history. It was, it was happenstance, and therefore, you will think lesser of me because I didn't plan to do this. It just happened. And actually, what happened was this. I was, uh, and I was flying back from London, and I was reading my mail, and uh, I saw that I had been invited that very evening to uh, an event at Sotheby's where you could view the Magna Carta. And I um, didn't really know much about the Magna Carta, but I, but I knew the person who invited me, so I got off the plane, I changed and so forth. I went to the Sotheby's that night, and I didn't really, I'm not an art collector really, so I didn't know Sotheby's that well. And I got there right before it closed, and the curator uh, explained to me what would happen. There were 17 copies of the Magna Carta, uh, 15 in British institutions, one in the Australian Parliament, and one that Ross Perot had bought in 1984, I think, for about a million and a half dollars, and he brought it back somehow out of the country, and he put it on display on a loan to the National Archives. Ross Perot had a fight with the National Archives, or for whatever reason, he decided to put it up for sale, and the curator said it was gonna to go to the highest bidder and probably would leave the country. 
uh, because it was thought, and she knew who the bidders were likely to be, that somebody from the Middle East or some part of Russia would buy it. And I just thought about it right then and there. I said, wait a second, this is the document that's the inspiration for the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. Clearly, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, when the Bill of Rights was drafted, the, the, the freedoms put in the Magna Carta were, were things that were very important to people. And so it was an inspiration. So not drafted here, I thought it should stay here. And so I decided I was going to come back the next night and buy it, but not tell anybody. If I told my wife, you know, I'm going to go and back and buy the Magna Carta, she would say, it's a little presumptuous, I'm going to back and buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. <laughs> If I told my children, they'd say, well, how much less money will this mean for us? So, <laughs> uh, so I, I just rearranged my schedule the next day. I went back to Washington. I, I came back, and I, I rushed back. And as all of you know, when you're trying to get to some place, um, naturally, the traffic didn't work. And I had to get out of the car and run the three more blocks to get to Sotheby's. I get there five minutes before the auction. The curator's there, because I told her I would probably come back. And I said, OK, I want to go down and then down there, get me a paddle. I'm gonna, she said, no, 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 this is the kind of thing. You don't want to be waving your hand. They have too many people. Just go in this little room. I didn't want to argue. I figured I'd miss the auction. So I get in this little side room. They lock the door. And um, they pick up a phone. All of a sudden, they, they, they hear they're starting the bidding. And so I get in the swing of things. And you know, I'd never been to an auction before at Sotheby. So I'm bidding. And all of a sudden, the guy says, sold. I was like, uh-oh. So the head of Sotheby's comes in and says, uh, who are you? Um, <laughs> You're not a customer here. We don't know you. Um, uh, you. You can't afford this, right? Uh, yes. OK, well, if you can afford it, you pay. It's yours. You can slip out the side door. Or, and there are 100 reporters there. And you can tell them uh, what, um, what you're going to do with it. And I said, well, I'm going to give it as a gift to the country. I'm putting it on permanent loan to the National Archives. And I just thought it was the appropriate thing to do. Um, because I was afraid that it would leave the country. And, and then I it kind of led to other people calling me up and saying, well, I have a Magna Carta. Would you like to buy mine? And you know, I think they're fake. So I, I have a standard letter that says now, I, uh, I don't want to corner the market in you know, Magna Cartas. Um, but interestingly, you know, all of you are familiar with the Magna Carta in the sense it may be the most famous document in, in history in some ways. Um, it, the, the famous uh, 1215 document. Actually, that one was abrogated by King John within a couple weeks. So all of what you've learned, Runnymede, King John, 1215, was abrogated, never went into effect, because King John was told he would be excommunicated by the pope if he actually honored it, because it said, in effect, that the barons could overturn his ruling. And the pope said, if you can overturn the king's ruling, maybe you can overturn the pope's ruling, so you have to abrogate it. And he did. So ultimately, there was another uh, Magna Carta in 1297. That's the one that actually went into effect and is the law of England still. But the one in 1215, when I read about it, it said, there's provisions in there that said, if, you're somebody, if you owe money to somebody who's Jewish, you don't have to pay. I said, wow, that's not very nice. So I did the reading, and it turns out that Jews were money lenders. They couldn't do anything else in England then. And so the copy that I actually bought, the 1297 version, not the 1215 version, doesn't have that provision. So I said, why is it they started to like Jews all of a sudden, and they don't want to criticize them anymore? Or, or for me, it turns out in 1270, they kicked all the Jews out of England. So there were no Jewish money lenders then, I guess. So anyway, um, that's the, the story about the Magna Carta. And when I, after I bought it, I went to have dinner at somebody's house. I think it was the president of Citicorp. I said, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm late. I just bought the Magna Carta. He said, oh, sure, sure. And, uh, <laughs> So uh, then he called me the next day and was in the newspapers. He said, I, David, nobody ever came to my house and said they bought the Magna Carta. <laughs> I thought you were kidding. So let me tell you one other story, uh, if I could. And this relates to sex, which everybody will get everybody's attention. So one, I, I am a region of the Smithsonian. And, a region, and the Smithsonian, as many of you know, is a great institution. It has 19 museums. And um, it's, it's uh, a spectacular um, gift, actually, from uh, the, Mr. James Smithson, who actually gave the money for the Smithsonian uh, about 150 years ago. And the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian actually owns the National Zoo. And so one day, the head of the National Zoo came in and was explaining the situation with the most famous, or the most, uh, um, I'd say, liked animals or species on the face of the earth, pandas. There are 99% um, of all the species who ever lived on the face of the earth are gone. 99% are gone. 1% is left, and that's 5 million species. The most popular species on the face of the earth, in my view, is not humans, but pandas. And um, the pandas, uh, you may remember when Richard Nixon went to China, he brought back two pandas. He was given their gift by, the, by Mao Zedong. The Chinese got smarter, and later they rented these pandas. And now they rent the pandas around the world, a million dollars a year for two pandas. And you got a male and a female, you rent them, and they, hopefully they produce some more pandas, but you have to give the pandas back if, they're, uh, if, they're, if they reproduce. And um, the reason is that, uh, that they, the Chinese do this is they're trying to get money. The money is really used to help with panda, what's called conservation, but really reproduction. And here's the problem. There are seven and a, seven and a half billion people on the face of the earth. Or se seven billion people, I guess, about seven billion people. When I was born, there were two and a half billion. 
Now there's 7 billion people, and uh, a lot of people. There are only 1,600 pandas on the face of the earth, 1,600. 300 in captivity and 1,300 in the wild. Now, why is it there's so few pandas? Well, they only live in northern China and they can only eat bamboo and there's fewer places that grow bamboo, but the real reason is evolution, or God, came up with a system that is very unique. Pandas can reproduce only four hours a day, one day a year. So think about how many people there would be or how few people there would be if humans could actually reproduce only one, and now unlike humans, uh, the pandas only, only uh, mate when they can reproduce. Humans don't do that. But pandas do. So pandas can only four hours a day. So what happens in the wild in captivity is the pandas are giving off scents in various ways I won't describe about what they're, what they're ready to do. And then they get together in the wild or in captivity at the appointed time. But the problem is they're so inexperienced because they only get to do this four hours a day one day a year that the parts don't go where they're supposed to go and they don't really know what to do. So the Chinese have a system where they have a system in captivity where they show movies of pandas mating, but the panda's eyesight is not that good so they can't figure out what it is. So I analogize it to members of Congress. Um, pandas know what they're supposed to do but they don't really know how to do it. And members of Congress know what they're supposed to do but they really don't know how to do it. And that's the problem we have in Washington right now. <laughs> We know pandas when we see them. Eden, thank you, David. That was thank wonderful. you very thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Panda porn. What a wonderful, interesting, thoughtful, and very funny conversation. A treat for us all. I'm Eden Rafshun, president of FAPE. And on behalf of FAPE, I want to thank you both, David and John for your time, your wisdom, um, your great good humor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You're the best. The library is the perfect place for this step into history. And we would like to recognize Tony Marks, president of the library, who graciously arranged for us to be here tonight, and Vanessa Novak and Emily Neidart from the library's special events office, who were key to, to tonight's success. Thank you both. And a very special thanks to all of you for joining us for this celebration.